Good morning, everyone. There is no kids' praise or junior church, so kids, if you want to get a bulletin, um, there's even crayons around here for you to fill it out, and you'll get candy afterwards. Um, just as a reminder, now we are having a congregational meeting, and there's a few people who said that they just couldn't make it for whatever reason. Some are traveling. Well, there is one guy, I'm getting my phone out on purpose, who wasn't really feeling like he could make it today. I am going to do something for him. Actually, you are going to do something for him. Russ has had a very hard week, and so he couldn't come today. And so we are going to take a little snapshot video, okay, from my perspective up here. He always sits in the back, and so he always sees what the back of your heads looks like. <laughs> so I thought it would be good for him to see what you look like from the front, all right? So I'm going to take a little video. I will tell you when I start. And you guys, see, I'm, I'm over here, so don't say anything yet. But I'm going to pan it around, and then you guys can say hi, Russ, or whatever you want. And I'm starting. Hi, Russ. Hi, Russ. Hi, Russ. Hi, Russ. Hi, Russ. Hi, Russ. Good to see you. See, your church loves you. Okay, and I'm sending it to him right now, since he couldn't be here today. Um, so if I stop the servant to tell you he's replying, now you'll know why. He doesn't know we're doing this either. So not only will he get to see it in the text, but if he watches the video on YouTube, he'll get to see it twice. Okay, we've been starting a new sermon series about the topic people love to talk about. Um, actually, I just opened the wrong sermon again. That video that we saw up there... There we go. That video we saw shows why we give. We don't give out of obligation. We give because it's part of our worship, as we saw last week. In our country, we like to honor lots of things. Yesterday was Veterans Day, and we were taking time to honor our veterans for the service that they've given us. Uh, there are some great statues in our, our country to represent and to honor our past government leaders. One of the most iconic leaders and one that we've honored, of course, is George Washington. There are statues all over our country honoring this first president. And here's some pics of them, if you want to go ahead. You can see these. You got, I've seen them at Mount Rushmore. You see these other iconic um, statues. There's some on the quarter and the dollar bill, and there's some where he's riding on the, the horse. Every February, on, just leave those up there. On George Washington's birthday, a late news, um, the late newspaper columnist Frederick C. Offman used to visit the West Wing of the Smithsonian Institute. Now keep thinking of these. And he would look at a certain statue there among the antique printing presses, the reprints of pieces of his columns. And, and he would take this time on this day to look at a certain statue. As a tribute to government bungling, he would write an article every year about it. In one of the articles he wrote, it said it began in 1833 when Horatio Genro Greenrow was paid $5,000 in 1833. He was paid $5,000. So that is a lot of money back then. To sculpt a heroic statue of George Washington for the Capitol's Rotunda. Horatio went to Florence, Italy, and emerged several years later with a 20-ton marble statue. It's a huge statue. When the longshoremen started to hoist the statue on the boat, the rope broke, and George sank into the mud. The U.S. Navy sent a battleship. So not only did it cost $5,000 to pay him to do it, now we're paying for a, a Navy vessel to go get it all the way to Italy. It fished George Washington out of the water in the mud and took him to New York. Because some of the railroad tunnels between there and New York weren't big enough, they took him from New York down to New Orleans um, and forwarded him through divisive routes, tunnels, and rivers. So we paid him to make it. Then we had to pay a ship to go get it. And then because it wasn't going to work, we had to pay them even more to go another longer route. This artistic enterprise had now cost over $26,000. Now in today's standards, we're looking at a quarter million. 
is what it would have cost if it was done today. Then when they got the statue to the rotunda, it proved too heavy and was quickly moved. So they had to pay again to have it moved again. And then they unveiled it on George Washington's birthday in 1843. The Navy band tootled the, the landmarks. There were speeches and the Speaker of the House pulled the string. And here was the picture of George Washington. Go ahead. The first president looking like a Greek god. <laughs> Over the Capitol Hill rose a horrified gasp. After weeks of bitter debate, Congress decided to build a wooden shed to cover this monstrosity, <laughs> which costs another $1,600 to hide this statue. By 1908, the shed was so weathered and beaten, lawmakers were mortified. So they paid $5,000 to tear it down and to haul this semi-naked George Washington in the dead of night, because they were so ashamed of it, to the Smithsonian. Now, why did Friedrich Hoffman visit the Smithsonian every February and reprint the story? Why did he do this? Because he was constantly exposed to governmental waste and incompetence. And this story perfectly symbolized people's bad judgment in the government. And this made Othman so upset it made him angry. Have you ever had to spend money and it made you angry that you had to do it? That it, it was just, oh. uh, my dad lent me the car a few times. And um, there was this pharmacy called Hooks at the time. I think it got changed to CVS. And they had this one little sign in there. Um, parking lot, and by little I mean about 50 foot tall. And I kept backing into it. And I caused a couple dents in the bumper, and it made Dad mad. Because here's this nice flat chrome bumper with a dent, and I hit it in the same spot each time, which kept making it, Dad didn't want to spend money. It made him angry to spend money. Have you ever seen somebody, have you seen yourself angry to spend money? Anger is a strong, Emotion. I, at one point, because I knew the kids were going to be in here today, I'm like, how do I incorporate them? Do I ask the kids to come up and say, show me what your parents look like when they're mad? <laughs> and then I thought, no, that might get someone in trouble. <laughs> I just really kept playing. I'm like, who did I pick? And, oh, I can't choose that one. And, and not my kids. <laughs> so kids, I want you to show your parents at home what they look like when they're mad. But don't do it in public. We've all seen people get angry. But how many of us stop and consider how God is when he's angry? Do we ever stop and think about the anger of God? I, I live with parents who were redheads. Okay? And a redhead is typically, you know, very gentle and patient. Right? Or the exact opposite. <laughs> yeah. Okay? And so when I think of anger, I can think of faces getting brighter than the hair. And then I stop and think about the anger of God. Well, it actually talks about it in 2 Samuel 24.1. Again. Notice that word. Again. This means it wasn't the first time. Again, the anger of the Lord, what's that word? Burned against Israel. You ever had somebody so mad that when they were looking at you, you could feel that anger burning into you? Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and make a census of Israel and Judah. Now, now we're not told why God is angry at this moment. And that made me think, but why is this? Everything in Scripture, I think, is there for a purpose, is there for a reason. And so we can't just say, oh, it didn't tell us, so let's move on. We need to look back into that. So I started thinking about it. I started reading behind the text. And the more I thought about it, it seemed like his anger had to do with pride. There's nothing any of us have to deal with today, right? We're, we're all good. We're humble and we're proud of it, right? <laughs> so the more I thought about pride is in the people's accomplishments and power. You know, we see that. Look how we've done. Horatio wanted to show how great his statue was, and it was nothing to be proud of. 
The previous chapters of 2 Samuel 23 detail the successes of David's armies that he's had in the battles against the Philistines and the Moabites and, and other armies. And as I read this, it kept going over my head. That Through my head, I was like, these people are getting arrogant. They're getting prideful. Look what our David did. Look how conquerors we are. And who are they pointing their, their selves to? They're saying, look what we did. Look what David has done. And because of the army's successes, nobody dared stand up to them. Nobody dared come against them. When, when I was in high school, we had a good football team in our high school. I don't know what class we were. We may not have been a high class. But we went to the state. We went to play for the state championship. We were good. And people around our area knew Southwood football. And it was awesome. And people didn't say anything bad about us because, you know what? We were going to beat you on the field. Even more so, people didn't say anything about Israel because their army was trouncing over all of them. Anybody who came against them tucked tail and ran. And as a result, I think Israel began to think, we're pretty good. We're top. We're the big dogs. They begin to think of themselves as unbeatable and invincible. And I believe they took their eyes off God. And they forgot it was God who gave them the victories. It was God who took the enemies and threw them away. It was God who delivered them. And because of that, a simple attitude of pride began to settle in. And I think we need to realize this. That if God's chosen people, the Israelites, can start falling into that. What does that tell us about God's chosen people, the church? That we can start thinking and having a simple attitude of pride settle in. In Deuteronomy, God's people were warned against this. In Deuteronomy 8, it says, But that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty, when things are going well, you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey His commands, regulations, and decrees that I'm giving you today. For when you become full and prosperous, and have built fine homes to live in when your flocks and herds become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. And the Hebrew there, we see an exclamation point. He is emphatic in this. You've got to be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord, your God, who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. I think Israel at this time has forgotten that it's God, not David. It's God, not the army, who has won their victories, who has saved them, who has protected them. And so in verse 1 of 24, again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. And he said, go take a census. And it appears this attitude had a, a pride has also affected David. And it says he incited David against them. He turned David against them. Why take a census? I, again, it's, if it's in here, we need to learn from it. We need to see what this means. So why would God do that? Why would God incite David to take a census? I believe it was because census symbolized the pride of Israel. It, it was to show their strength of war. It symbolized the faith of the power of their military. Just like this reporter that went and saw this really bad statue of George Washington. He saw it as an object lesson to symbolize governmental waste. God used the census as an object lesson to say, look, you are not big enough to get these victories. You are not powerful enough. Turn your eyes back to who is doing this. He was bringing judgment on Israel because of this. And David's attitude was such that it wasn't until after the census had been taken that he realized the folly of all the people. He realized what was going on. And a result of this pride, of this sinful attitude in people of Israel, God anger burned against them and a plague came out. And as a result, 70,000 people had died and more were sick. Can you imagine if we started getting physical consequences for our sinful pride? Uh, wouldn't that be a wake-up call? Look what happens in verses 16 and 17. When the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem. No, 
to destroy them. The Lord relented concerning the disaster and said to the angel who was afflicting the people, Enough! Withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was at the threshing floor of that guy, the Jebusites, Arana. When David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, I have sinned, I the shepherd have done wrong, these are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall on me and my family. That right there, that verse right there is a sermon that we don't have time to get into today. But David saw this plague, this angel bringing about the destruction because of the sin. And as the leader of the people, David recognized this is my fault. Don't harm the people. Bring it upon me. And in answer to David's prayer, God tells him to build an altar on this threshing floor. David buys this property. He builds an altar. In verse 25, David built an altar to the Lord and sacrificed burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered his prayers on behalf of the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. It's great stories. This is wonderful. But we're in a series about money. And what in the world does this have to do with money? In our sermon series of talking about money, we're going to talk about our time, you know, how we can give up our time. We can give up our talents, and people give up their talents. But most of all, we are talking about our treasures. And what does that mean? You know, we need to give our time. We need to give our talents because God is giving you those to use to spread his message, to honor him and to bring people to him. But we need to talk about our treasure also, our money. Last week we looked at how giving is a part of worship, showing we acknowledge God, that how we honor him in that. But what does this event in Israel's history teach us? What, what is in there that we can learn? Can you imagine that if your actions would cause 70,000 people to die? We don't like the idea of punishment, do we? In fact, we've come up with pass the buck. It's not my fault. It's his job. It's his fault. We like to pass the buck. But it's not my fault. I was raised in a society that was me-centered. This is why I'm this way. It's not my fault. Don't we hear that a lot? And as parents, when your kids say that, what do you want to do? That's your, it's not my fault I hit you. <laughs> we like to pass the buck. And yet David did something different. We don't like the idea of punishment. And yet over and over in God's word, it teaches us there is a price for sin. There is a price that must be paid for sin. Because of sin, God's judgment was poured out on Israel. That was the Old Testament, right? We're in the New Testament. We have electricity and indoor plumbing. Stuff they never had. So what is that? Well, look at Romans, New Testament, verse 23 of 6. For the wages of sin is death. And 323 of Romans, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. In other words, we all deserve the penalty, the wages of sin, which is Death. You and I deserve, because you and I have sinned, we deserve to, to die. We don't like that idea. <clears throat> Wait a minute. I'm a good person. It's not my fault. But the Word of God just says this. And it's not just talking of physical death. We're talking spiritual death here. An eternal separation from God. His blessings, His love. How many of you have ever experienced a time when you were... When you're by yourself, and, and you're not being distracted by something, and then you remember. You, I mean, you're just having a nice time, and you're enjoying yourself. And then all of a sudden, this, this past event, this past attitude, something you said or done or thought that you're ashamed of comes back to your mind. Something you've done, and it's like, oh, I can't believe I did that. And it could be years ago, but the, but it still haunts you from now, from time to time. Do you remember the wave of guilt that has swept over you? The pain and the anguish. The intense desire that wish. I can tell you, there are times in my life I wish I had a time machine. I want to go back 
Change it. I want to smack the doggy of that time and say, don't do that. Change your action. Do it differently. Because I hate what happened in there as a result of my sin, a result of my attitude, a result of pride. Pain and anguish, the intense desire that I wish it never happened. I just want to crawl in a corner when that thing starts waving over me. The pain and the anguish that God experienced because I chose that. And we need to realize sin makes God angry. Sin drives him crazy because he knows it's the wrong thing. Have you ever seen a parent whose kid keeps choosing to do the wrong thing and they keep getting mad? They're like, they know. They know this and yet, oh, they're choosing it. And there's a loss for words and the anger comes out of them. How much more is the holy anger of God when he sees his people who have chosen to be in the family of faith and still choose sin? Sin makes God angry. Ephesians 2 tells us, once you were dead because of your disobedience to your many sins. He's talking to Christians. You were once dead. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. There is a price for sin, and our sin makes God angry. Nothing in this world is free, right? If, it's, if they're telling you it's free, it's too good, isn't it? There's always a catch. Yeah, I had some uh, family who were trying to get me into this business of selling these things, and, and I went to my father-in-law, and I'm like, Hey, I can sell them on this. This is good stuff. And I showed it to him. He goes, Donnie, that's a pyramid scheme. I'm like, I'm not going to Egypt. <laughs> I'm serious. That's what I said. I was young and dumb. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about here. I'm not doing a pyramid. I'm just trying to get you to buy this from me. And then you have to sell it to two other people. And then it's like, oh, pyramid scheme. <laughs> gotcha. Good thing I didn't. Oh, wait, I did put money into this. <laughs> Nothing in life is free. Okay, so nothing in this world is free. And because of that, someone has to pay the price for my sin and for your sin. Kids, how many of you want a candy bar? Yeah. Jason's a kid, and I want a candy bar. You can't just get a free candy bar when you come to church. What do you have to do? You fill out the, there's a price to be paid. You have to fill out the bulletin, and then you get a candy bar. There's a price. It's a reward. Adults, how many of you would like to not go to work and get a full paycheck? Yeah. It doesn't work that way. You've got to fill up the bulletin. You've got to do your job, and then you get a paycheck. We want that, but there has to be a price that has to be paid. Someone has to pay the price for your sin and my sin. The people at this time, back in the Israelites, were paying a terrible price for sin until David stepped in. The plague was averted. Because David was willing to pay the price. He was saying, enough. Put the penalty of them on me. I will carry the burden. It was his purchase of the land. He went and physically, financially paid for this land. It was his sacrifice that he placed on the altar. That he had built. You see, this is what we need to understand. What is offered to God must cost something. You cannot offer something to God that is meaningless. You can't sit there and say, well, I didn't work for it. I don't really care about it. Sure, God, you can have it. That's leftovers. That's something you don't even care about. I will always give you asparagus if you want it. Okay? Out of the bottom of my heart, I will give you asparagus, cooked broccoli, spinach, liver and onions. I want you to have it so I don't. And is that really heartfelt? No. If I really want to give you something, I'm going to give you my cheese, steak, okay? And that shows love. That shows it costs something. What is offered to God must cost something. And it was because of David's sacrifice given, because he loved the people, that God's judgment stopped. 
And here, here's a little note I want you to know. In doing some research on this, that hill that David bought, that hill, that threshing floor where he built an altar, thousands of years later, actually hundreds of years later, was the temple that Jerusalem served God. It all started with a sacrifice. It all started with someone saying, look God, I will pay the price. Let me pay the price for their sin. That very spot, isn't that a good insight of where the temple comes from? Where the temple mount is? Someone has to pay the price. We've all sinned. We just read the scripture that proclaimed the truth. You and I, for all have sinned. I was going to ask this. Okay, let's ask. Is anyone perfect here? No, you're wearing a bear shirt. You're not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. I'm getting people like, here. I can see a few perfect people here. And those are the ones that um, can't really speak yet. The little childs, the infants. Everyone else, we have all sinned. Okay, so if we have all sinned, if we're not perfect, we owe a price. Anyone who has lived a perfect, who has never done any harm, gets an automatic free ticket to heaven because they are perfect. But the rest of us, the rest of us who are sinners, the ones who have caused anger to God, the ones who have a debt because of our sin, we must pay for that. It is on us. That is my bill. One of the most quoted and beloved scriptures that is declared, declares where this price is paid. John 3, 16. For this is how God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son that only a few. No. For everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. What this scripture tells us is God loves you so much he said, stop. I will pay the price. The punishment, the plague of sin that is going to kill you is going to be on me. I will pay for it. He offered a sacrifice that cost him something. The sacrifice that he offered ends the plague of sin and spiritual death. And it was on a hill that he offered a sacrifice of his own son on an altar that looks like something behind me on the wall right now. See, sin has a terrible price that must be paid. Secondly, God has paid that price for us. In, in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, we just looked at but look what happens. Verse 3 and following. All of us used to live that way. We all used to live according to the sinful desires, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. But here's where it changes. God is so rich in mercy. He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life. When he raised Christ from the dead, it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. This is huge. Now keep this in your mind, okay? He loves you so much. He paid the price of your sin. He looked at you and said, that person is too precious to me. I don't want them to go to hell. Let me take their punishment. Put it on my tab. And what does this have to do with our offering place? Nothing. These verses have nothing to do with the amount of money you put in an offering. Okay? God has said in other places we need to tithe, we need to give a tenth, and then we also need to put an offering in a part of that. God has never told us a number. He never says, you must give this amount of money. Instead, these verses tell us something about why we give. Not how much, but why. God loves a what? Cheerful giver. You know, if you ask me for money, I'm like, <laughs> it's not very cheerful. And you're like, you know what, he doesn't like me. But if I'm like, here, you need 20, here's another 20, and then why don't you have something else nice for the wife? There you go. I was like, wow, he's a cheerful giver. Okay? We need to be cheerful givers, okay? 
Why do you give money when the plate is passed in church? Is it, well, you just got to do it? Is it so people don't look at you weird and go like, hey, you didn't put enough in. Well, let's pass it back down. I, I've actually seen that in the church. They passed it, and the guy shook it, and he said, let's try it again. Oh, that's not very cheerful, is it? Do you put something in to ease your conscience? Ah, let's see what I got. I'll just throw that in, and then I'll feel better. Do you give because, you know, that's just part of what you do at church? See, God did not give his son, Jesus, to die in the Christ because that's just what you do. God did not send his son unto the world so that you can say, eh, let's see what I can spare. He gave him for a reason. Even David declared, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me Nothing. David said this. That's why he bought this property. That's why he personally built this altar and paid for the sacrifice and did it himself. It was because David understood his own sin. And it was when he understood his sin, he finally got to see the view of God's mercy. Something he didn't deserve. This great, powerful, loving God. And that's when he offered his gifts to God. It was offensive to him to have an offering that didn't cost him anything. It was offensive to just throw something cheap towards this God who saved his people. Likewise, it's only when you and I realize our own sinfulness that we realize the punishment we deserve. I think sometimes we forget. The longer we've been in church, we forget we are evil people. We forget we are sinful I want you to know, Scripture says none of you are good. Compare yourself to the, to the image of Christ and then tell me you're good. I'm not. We like to compare ourselves to some other evil people. Well, I'm better than that person. Well, don't consider yourselves to them. Consider yourself to Jesus. We need to realize that we are not good people, that God is good and he pours out his blessings in us and cleanses us from unrighteousness and puts his goodness in us. And I am not saying, let me say this right now, I'm not saying that when that plate is passed that you are buying your salvation, that you're saying, okay God, this is how much I love you, now let me in heaven. That is not how it happens. This is not how it happens in my home. My kids don't sit there and say, okay dad, because I want your love, because I want you to take care of me, I'm going to give you all this stuff here doesn't work. I love my kids and I want them in my family. I want to take care of them because they're mine. You do not buy your salvation. Giving is not a substitute for a relationship. I've seen parents who throw money at their kids. They, they just want to be their kids' friends. Oh, kids, right now listen to me. Your parents are not your friends. They're never meant to be. They're your parents. Parents are going to make you mad. Do you know why? Because they love you and they want the best for you. Now you can have a friendship relationship with them when you're older and you have kids and you realize, you know what, I was pretty dumb to my parents. And then your parents can come by and say, yeah, you're not their friend either. Yeah, they're going to not like you and I love you and I'm laughing at you right now. My mom just told me on the phone yesterday, you deserve two boys. And she said it in love. She really did while she was laughing at me. <laughs> so we don't do this to buy our salvation. God is not trying to be your best friend. He is trying to be your Lord, your master, your savior. And he poured out everything for your benefit. And so giving money is never a substitute for a real relationship. If all you're doing is throwing in a little bit just to ease your mind, then what are you saying about the price of your sin? If when that plate comes by and you're like, eh, I got about 10, let's just throw that in there. What are you saying about how much your sin has grieved God? I, I've said this for the last few Sundays. Let me make a bold statement. Okay? I'm getting bold, I think. Or more bold. But let me make this. What if the amount we give to God is a reflection on how much we are thankful for his forgiveness? That's not my line. I found that from someone else, and I was like, wow. What if how much I give to God, time, talent, and treasure, is a reflection of how thankful I am for his forgiveness? 
But that check I just wrote really symbolizes how much I'm thankful. I give to God because I know how much he gave to me. Just look at the cross. Think about the blood that he shed for you. If you have given your life to Christ, what happened to your sinful life? If you've given your life to Christ, what did he do with your sin? He picked it up and he set it on top of his son. And his son held it on the grave, on the cross, and took it to the grave so we can live. His gift of perfect life in exchange for our sinful one gives us the amount of undescribable love. When we realize that, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Here's the transforming part, the change. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. At one time in London, there was a restaurant owner, owner named Emil Metter, who was a close friend of Albert Schweitzer. Emil Metter was never allowed a Christian worker to pay for his meal in his restaurant. Now, I don't know how he knew they were Christians. I just read this account that he never allowed a Christian worker to pay for the meal. Um, Emil happened to open his cash register in the presence of the secretary of the London Missionary Society. Okay, the secretary was astonished to see among the bills. Have you ever seen the cash registers come out? You know there's all these sections. But in this thing was a, amongst all these bills and coins, was a six-inch nail. You ever seen a railroad spike? Think about something like that. The secretary said, what is that doing in there? And Matter explained, I keep the nail with my money to remind me of the price that Christ paid for my salvation and what I owe him. In return. We don't have this up here to worship. This, this is just a piece of wood. And this is, we're not worshiping some idol. This is a reminder of what Christ paid for my sin and what yours. When the communion is passed, that's a reminder of what his body took on because of my sin. When the offering plate is passed, it's a reminder of how much my life in his hands and how much I want to give back to him. I'm not saying you put money in the offering plate to buy your way to heaven. What I am saying is because I know the cost of my sin, because I know the price Jesus paid for my life, why wouldn't I want to give him more? Why wouldn't I want to give him more and more? So what about you? Kids know that when there's something good, They'll do anything to get it, right? I, I, when I was younger, I wanted to go to the swimming, and mom said, you guys need to clean the house, do the dishes and laundry and all that stuff. Within an hour, the entire house was spotless because we wanted to go to the swimming pool. When you want to go somewhere, the kids, you give them an incentive. But offering isn't how you get there. It's our attitude. So when that's going, thank God, I want to show you how much I want to to be in your heaven. I want to show you how much, and that's not just with money, that's your time and your talents. Whether it's working with wood, it's working in an office, it's working with children, it's working with the minister, we give all that because of how much he has given to us. And right now the kids are getting restless. You know why they're tired of hearing me? They know something's better. There are a lot of you who know there's something better on the other side of these curtains. Don't you? There's food. There's a meal coming. The offering plate is just a way to say, God, I know something better is coming. And then tell them, use anything you can. I'm not doing this again to get more to the church. I'm saying let your faith expound. Okay, we're going to have time of invitation. We're going to start singing, kids. It's time to get loud again. Okay? And you guys can be loud. It's okay. Not the adults. Except for Jason. He's so good. But we want to share our faith. We want to exemplify God. We want to exalt, or not exalt, exhort Him to lift Him up. And so when we sing this song, will you lift up your voices? Will you proclaim it? And if you need to make a decision for the Lord, won't you do it and know that He went to that cross for you? It's okay. 
Okay? So let's stand, let's sing, and let's come before him like these children.